introduction. And it's, um, it's a it's a great honor to to speak here, and um, I, I guess uh, I was uh, I was invited before the pandemic started. I'm looking forward to bit, um, coming in person, but um, it's good to at least see all of you uh, online, and hopefully we'll be able to see everyone in person again soon. So um, I'll be talking about random constraint satisfaction problems and. Um, um, as this, because this is a plenary talk, I want to give a sort of maybe broader introduction of the, the topic and um, for, for maybe, so some of you may have heard of um, some, of, some of the things I'm going to talk about before, and it will be towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about some quite, quite new results. But uh, okay, so, if, so what's a random constraint satisfaction problem? Well, um, a constraint satisfaction problem is, a, is an idea that comes from theoretical computer science and combinatorics. It's one of the kind of basic elements of, um, or sort of basic examples of NP complete problems. Uh, and it basically means exactly what it sounds like. You have some set of variables and a collection of constraints you want them to satisfy. So imagine solving a system of equations, coloring a graph, satisfying some Boolean formula. Um, and because I'm from probability theory, um, I'll be interested in the random version of this, where the constraints are chosen randomly according to some rule or distribution. So just to, to fix an example in mind of what a cons random constraint satisfaction looks like, take your you know, favorite example of a sparse random graph. So maybe something like a erdos renyi random graph where uh, between each um, pair of uh, vertices, you have an edge independently with some probability or a, or a random regular graph where uh, you, you choose uniformly from random graphs that are deregular. And I should say, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about the sparse version of these where the num n, the number of vertices tends to infinity while um, the average degree remains fixed. And so we have our random graph and we can ask, is there a proper K coloring of the graph? So this is a constraint satisfaction problem. The variables are the, the colors of the vertices and the edges are the constraints. They're saying that neighboring vertices have to have different colors. And because the edges were chosen at random, it's a random constraint satisfaction problem. Um, another sort of property we could ask about is, is there a, an independent set of a, of a, of a large size, say, bigger than uh, beta times n. Um, it's sort of like saying, you know, you have uh, your, <clears throat> you want to invite friends to a party, but you know certain pairs of friends hate each other. And so you want to have, what is the biggest party you can have when no one's going to start a fight? That's sort of um, the question of sort of finding a large independent set. And uh, we're interested in the case where those sort of I guess mutual animosities are chosen at, at random. Um, another sort of example, and perhaps the canonical example of a constraint satisfaction problem is uh, the random KSAT model. It's a, it's a random Boolean formula. So you have N variables taking values either true or false. And for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna say either plus or minus. And, um, and the constraints are formed by taking the or of K of the variables or their negations. Um, out of the 2n choose k possible uh, uh, such clauses. And uh, then we want all of these clauses or constraints to be satisfied, so we take the and of them. So a, a three sat formula with four clauses might look something like this. And, uh, and a solution to the problem is just an assignment of the variables so that the formula evaluates to, to true. And I'll call this either a solution or a satisfying assignment. Um, okay. And, uh, and obviously, the more um, constraints you put on, the fewer solutions you'll have, the harder it will be to find a solution. Um, so we can sort of parameterize the difficulty of a problem by um, the constraint or clause density, the ratio of the number of constraints divided by the number of variables. And I'll call this alpha. And we're interested in how things change as, uh, as we let alpha grow. Um, and uh, and that's sort of the right scaling to have between the clauses and uh, um, variables. 
Um, and let me just mention uh, one more model. Uh, this is called a variant of the KSAT model called the NAE SAT or not all equal SAT. Um, and it asks that it's a random KSAT formula, but it asks that both X and its negation evaluate to true. And this is equivalent to saying that in each clause, at least one term evaluates to true and at least one term evaluates to false, hence the name not all equal. It has sort of some extra symmetry to it. And this makes it more tractable than some of the other the models. And so oftentimes this is the first, like for different phenomena that we want to establish, oftentimes not all equal SAT is the simplest one to establish it in and, and therefore the first. Um, and sometimes I'll also be interested in the regular version of it where every variable appears in the same number of clauses. Okay. Um, and so I've mentioned four different random constraint satisfaction problems. And what we'll see is that although they're, you know, their definitions are quite different, they all um, have the same kind of behavior. Um, okay. I also want to mention a sort of graphical interpretation of the, these problems. Uh, so for the combinatorial properties of random graphs, it's kind of obvious what the underlying graphic graph is there. Um, but what about for a, a random KSAT formula? Well, we can encode this as um, what's called a factor graph, which will be a, a bipartite graph where we, we take the formula and on one side of the, of the graph, for each variable, we have a vertex. On the other side, we have a vertex for each clause and we just connect a clause to a variable if that variable appears in the clause. So, so we get some graph that kind of encodes the formula. And because the clauses were chosen randomly, it's a random graph. And like most models of random graphs, it's, uh, it's locally tree-like in the sense that if, you, if I pick a, a variable at random and look at their local neighborhood, um, I won't see any cycles. Um, what I'll see is just a tree. There are cycles in the graph, but they're much longer. The cycles are, if there's n variables, the cycles are of length at least log n typically. Where, whereas if I just look at a constant radius ball, I'll just see, um, um, I'll just see a tree in. Uh, okay. And it's, it's this property of being locally tree-like actually that, that makes these models particularly tractable. And it's the reason why we can calculate um, some of the important thresholds in these models exactly. Okay, so what are, what are the things that we want to calculate? Well, the number one question is the satisfiability threshold. When are there satisfying assignments? Um, but then once we, once we can answer that question, we can ask other questions. So if we know there are solutions, we can ask how many solutions are there? Um, we can ask what does a random solution look like? We could take several solutions at random and ask what their joint distribution looks like. Are they typically close to each other or far apart from each other? Um, and we could ask the algorithmic question of, um, you know, is there an efficient, say, polynomial time algorithm that given a problem will find a solution? Okay, so let me start with uh, the satisfiability threshold and what we mean. Um, it, was, it was observed that uh, empirically, there seems to be a, a sort of sharp uh, threshold phenomena um, in terms of the probability of having a solution as you increase the um, um, constraint density. Um, but, you know, numerics being sort of limited, this is, this is sort of an example of uh, n equals 50. Um, um, we, we sort of want to understand what happens as, as n tends to infinity. And the satisfiability conjecture says that um, there should be a, a sharp threshold at some critical value alpha sat. So what that means is if we plot the probability of being satisfiable um, as a function of alpha, as n tends to infinity, it will become increasingly like a step function at some critical value alpha sat. So when alpha is less than alpha sat, the probability of being satisfiable tends to one. When alpha is greater than alpha sat, the probability should tend to zero. And I say this in terms of the, the KSAT model, but the same 
sort of thing should be true for random colorings and, and each of the other um, uh, models that I've mentioned and the, and the broader class of models that are in the same class. Um, for, the, for the satisfiability conjecture, it's now known in, for the case of k equals two and the case of k sufficiently large, um, but not say for the case of k equals three. And for random colorings, this remains a conjecture for all values of k. Um, okay. Um, so how, <clears throat> um, but for each of these models, we have a, there's a prediction for where this threshold uh, occurs. And, um, and so while these models originally were studied in combinatorics and theoretical computer science, the sort of the answers of how they should behave really came from uh, theoretical physics, in particular, the study of disordered systems such as uh, spin glass models um, of, of interacting uh, particles, particularly the work of uh, Mazard and Parisi on the Sharrington Kirkpatrick model. Um, and what they found was that many of the ideas developed for spin glasses, um, they predicted should also apply in these more sparse um, constraint satisfaction problems. Um, so over the course of the talk, I want to um, tell you about the different predictions they make, how they get to those predictions, and finally, how we prove, we've managed to prove some of them, um, but there's a lot still to do. So, so these are the, um, and when I say predictions, these are the kind of physicists that they develop theory, but they don't, um, they don't do mathematical proofs. Um, they have very deep insights and uh, they're usually right, not 100% of the time. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we find things that they didn't understand properly, but, but I mean, you can usually count on their um, insight into these problems. But, but they don't prove anything. So uh, for a mathematician, it's this rich source of conjectures to, to go out and try and prove. Uh, and you know, that's what I and quite a few other people have been working on over the last uh, couple of decades. So what the physicists will tell us is that each of these problems that I've mentioned fall into a, the one-step replica symmetry breaking class of, of models. And I'm going to say, later on more precisely what that means, what replica symmetry breaking means, essentially a sort of way of understanding the, the clustering of the solutions. And also another heuristic of theirs, the cavity method that's used for making various calculations. Okay. Um, but before I do that, I want to do something simpler, which is to just look at the um, <clears throat> expected number of uh, uh, solutions to say the random case out model. And I'll write Z for the, the number of solutions uh, because it's a random problem, Z will be random. And, um, and so we could look at the expected value of Z and there's two to the end possible assignments. Each of the clauses is sort of satisfied independently. So, so it's quite a simple formula for the expected value. And it's E to the N to the time sum exponent. So, so one value you could look at is the point at which this exponent is zero. Um, and so this separates the, the regime where the expected value is going to zero versus going to infinity. So by Markov's inequality, this is certainly an upper bound on the satisfiability threshold. And you might hope that this is actually the satisfiability threshold. Unfortunately, things are not that simple. Um, and in this case, it's um, easy to see why there'll be an epsilon fraction of the variables um, that are in none of the constraints at all, just by chance. So some of the variables don't appear in any of the constraints. So these are unconstrained. So if we have one solution, I could change these unconstrained variables in any way I like and arrive at another solution because they're not involved in the formula. So if I have one solution, I'll have at least two to the epsilon n solutions. And if you plug that into Markov's inequality, you would get a slightly better upper bound. Um, but it all, it's which is still not the right upper bound, unfortunately, there's more to do than that. But um, one thing it emphasizes is the fact that when you have um, 
when you have a solution, you have a lot of solutions nearby. Or put another way, solutions come in clusters of solutions. And understanding the way in which the solutions break into clusters is going to be one of the key ideas in, in what I want to tell you about. So the first moment method is good to get an upper bound. Uh, a natural way to get a lower bound would be to use the second moment method, which is useful when the, the second moment is of the same order as the first moment squared. Um, if, uh, <clears throat> and that actually gives quite good bounds in the case of the colorings and not a equal set. For random case, that actually it fails for any constraint density for, for certain technical reasons. But, but, there are, but one can apply the second moment method to other random variables and get lower bounds. And actually most of the progress made um, on random constraint satisfaction problems has been increasingly sophisticated uses of the second moment method to certain well-chosen random variables. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, go on and tell you sort of more about the physics predictions, but maybe I, um, I'll just pause for a moment in case anyone has any questions before I go on. Okay, well, if not, um, and, and feel free to, you know, ask questions in the chat, I'll, I'll, I should be able to see them as we go along. So while sort of the study of, by physicists of these random constraint satisfaction problems really started in, in say the eighties, it reached its final form um, by work of a sort of younger generation of physicists, um, Krajakula et al, um, in about say 14 years ago. And they just describe a sort of series of phase transitions that the models undergo as alpha, the, the density of constraints increases. Um, and uh, so what do these sort of, you know, ink blot like pictures mean? Well, um, going from left to right is meant to represent increasing density of constraints. And the, the little disks are supposed to be clusters of solutions. So what's a cluster of solution? Well, I can think of two solutions as being adjacent if they differ in just one or a small number of variables. Um, and so now if I have a notion of adjacency of solutions, I could talk about the connected components of, of solutions. And that will be the definition of a cluster. So, um, <clears throat> and what the physicists predicted was that when the density of constraints is small, all or almost all of the solutions are in one big cluster of solutions. Um, but then as we increase the density of constraints, there's a clustering threshold after which the, the space of solutions shatters into exponentially small many clusters, each with just an exponentially small fraction of the solutions and most of them well separated from each other. This seems to be the point at which it becomes sort of algorithmically hard to find a solution in the sense that, I mean, that's not something that, um, um, not something that can be, uh, um, so sorry, there was a question about why do we use Markov's inequality for the bounds? Um, in a sense, um, that, that's just sort of one way to get an upper bound or the second moment to get a lower bound. Um, but it turns out that but you know, if the quantities that we're looking at are concentrated around their expectation, then Markov's inequality will be a sort of good thing to look at. Um, but it turns out you have to be very careful in which quantities you, you apply the moment method to if you want that to be the case and sort of Having the knowing what to apply it to is, is in a sense the, the key art in these problems. Okay, um, and I'll, I'll come back to this point a bit later. Okay, so, uh, so we have this clustering threshold and as I was saying, this is um, supposed to be the uh, computational threshold. And what we know is that for each of the models I've described, there are algorithms 
that work up to just before the clustering threshold and find solutions uh, in um, sort of polynomial time, which is probably closer to linear, maybe just a bit more than linear time, in fact. But just above the clustering threshold, no algorithms that we know work or are even expected to work. That's not a proof that there are no efficient algorithms that do work, but um, you know, it, it's widely believed that this is a, a computational threshold. Uh, but one thing that doesn't change at this clustering threshold is um, on both sides, the model is what the physicists call replica symmetric. So a replica just means a random sample of a, of a solution. Um, and so, uh, and you can imagine taking two random solutions and looking at the distance between them. Um, in the replica symmetric regime, uh, or when the models are replica symmetric, the distance between two random solutions is concentrated on some value. Or, or put another way, most pairs of solutions are, the, are about the same distance apart. Um, and that's predicted in both the connected and in the clustered regime. There's another threshold, the condensation threshold, that's predicted to happen um, much closer to the satisfiability threshold, after which the space of solutions is still split into exponentially many clusters, but the biggest few clusters have most of the solutions. Um, so, so, so if you look at the, you know, 100 biggest uh, clusters that they should have you know, about 99% of the uh, solutions. Um, and, the, uh, and the biggest one and the second biggest one should be roughly of the same uh, order of magnitude. Um, now in this case, if, uh, if I pick two random solutions, two things can happen. Either they appear in different clusters and they'll be sort of fairly far away from each other, or they appear in the same cluster that also has a constant probability of happening, and then, uh, and then they're very close to each other. So if we look at the distance between two randomly chosen solutions, it can now be concentrated on two possible values, either very far or, or close together. And, um, and because there's now two possibilities for a pair of replicas and, and their distance, this is there's one extra possible distance. And so this is one step replica symmetry breaking. Um, uh, and this happens in this sort of final uh, regime, the condensation regime. And then the last, uh, the last threshold is called the, the satisfiability threshold. And after that, we see no more solutions. Um, okay, so everything I've said in this slide is just sort of very qualitative. It, um, but actually all of these predictions come with sort of quantitative values. So the physicists predict where each of these thresholds occur and, uh, and more information. So how many solutions you have in these different regimes and how many clusters you have of different sizes, what do the clusters look like? Um, there are sort of answers for all of those questions, um, <clears throat> which you know, we like to be able to prove. Okay, so how can... Oh, uh, so so one, ah, thanks. So what? So one question is: um, Are all of the clusters of the same size? So there's a lot of clusters. There's exponentially many clusters, but the um, but almost all of the solutions are just in the big ones. So um, there's you don't have um, you don't have sort of say a constant fraction of the solutions in in sort of very, very small ones that almost all of the solutions are in the big ones. There's a, there's a more refined prediction, which is that if you look at the relative cluster sizes, they satisfy what's called a Poisson Dirichlet distribution, um, uh, which sort of has that property that most of the mass is on the, the biggest few and there's some kind of um, decay of, of cluster sizes from there. Okay, um, but now 
the notion of cluster si clusters I've given you so far as connected components is not a very, um, not a very useful one. Um, so let me tell you a, a sort of almost equivalent definition, um, which is, is much more tractable. And this is uh, what's called the frozen model. So imagine we start off with one solution. Every variable is assigned either a plus or a minus. Um, and I want to sort of explore the cluster around that. So some of the variables can be flipped between pluses and minus, plus or minus without violating any of the constraints they're in. And I'll call these variables uh, free variables and, and mark them with a, an F. So we mark any variables that we can with as free. Now, by marking some of the variables as free, we might make other variables free. So we sort of keep iterating this process until there's no more variables that we can label as free. Um, and it turns out it doesn't matter the order in which we do that. And, uh, and we'll end up with everything labeled as either plus, minus, or free. What it turns out is that any solution in the, uh, for a given cluster, any solution will get mapped to the same assignment of plus, minus, or free. So we sort of mapped a whole cluster of solutions down to a single point. And this frozen model assignments of plus, minus, and threes is itself a, a constraint satisfaction problem. It satisfies a sort of slightly more complicated set of rules. So free variables must not be forced by any clause because otherwise we wouldn't have set them to be free. Plus or minus variables, on the other hand, must be forced by at least one clause, otherwise we would have set them to be free. And then any clause that has only pluses and minuses in it must be satisfied, the constraint must be satisfied. Uh, so this is a new constraint satisfaction problem. It's more complicated than the original one, but it has a it has a very nice property, which is that it doesn't have clustering. And the reason is we've sort of taken the clusters and sort of mapped them down to single points. So the, the space is no longer clustered. It's in fact replica symmetric for um, the entire range of values of alpha up to um, the satisfiability threshold. Um, and the reason for this is that the, the clusters, or the, sorry, the frozen model has a certain local rigidity property in the sense that for a typical solution of the frozen model, you won't find any um, other nearby valid configurations of the frozen model unless you change a linear number of the variables. Um, you can't typically just make a small change, you have to make a big change to go from one uh, solution to the other. So this local rigidity uh, removes the, the clustering and it, it makes it, um, and so we can in fact apply the um, you know, first and second moment methods to understand the, the frozen model. Okay, um, so now I want to tell you about another tool from physics, which, um, which is the cavity method. And basically this is a heuristic for adding in one extra variable and seeing what happens. So you're going from a system of size n to one of size n plus one. So imagine um, we add in a new variable v, the, this yellow one, and it, it's, it gets connected to sort of a random set of, of variables in the original model, um, these green ones. And because they're randomly chosen, um, despite what the picture looks like, they'll typically be far apart, okay? And so if we knew the joint distribution in the n size problem on these green variables, we could calculate you basically essentially doing some very simple calculations, basically just Bayes rule, what the, the law of the new variable is, what its marginal distribution is for a random solution. And we could also work out the multiplicative change in the partition function. So Zn plus one over Zn. And that's useful because if we want to work out log of Zn, we could then write it as a telescoping sum of log of these ratios. And so if we, if we knew what, how big this, this ratio was, that would be very useful for us. Um, okay, but what is the joint distribution of the, the green variables? Well, the, the heuristic is that if the model is replica symmetric, then they should be independent and their marginal distributions should be drawn from some law. Um, and what the, <clears throat> okay, 
but our models are not uh, are not always replica symmetric, but the frozen model is always replica symmetric. So we can apply the cavity method to the frozen model and um, um, and sort of calculate the, the change in the partition function from adding in one extra variable. Except there's one more thing that we don't know. I said that the, the marginal distribution of the, the green variables was drawn from some law mu. But what is mu? Well, uh, in the, when we added in a new variable, the vertex V shouldn't be a special, it should just be like, uh, like all the others. So it's marginal should also be drawn from law mu. Uh, but we said its law could be computed in terms of the law of the green ones. And this essentially says that mu must satisfy some sort of self-consistency relation. And in particular, it will be the, um, the solution of some fixed point equation. So let me tell you what this means in terms of the, the random KSAT model. And so this slide, I don't mean for you to sort of pass it in the time that I'm going to show it because it's uh, sort of quite complicated. I just mean to put this on the screen to make the point that the predictions that are, and the thresholds are very explicit. So first of all, you, you solve a measure valued recursion um, for, for mu. And this is essentially the chance that a, a particular variable will be a plus in a random cluster. And that will differ for different variables based on their local neighborhood. And so it will be, a, it will be given by some measure. Um, and then we take that measure mu um, and then the cavity method gives us some equation for sort of what's the expected change of log of the number of clusters as we go from size n to n plus one. Uh, and that's uh, this form, second formula here. And so then what's the prediction for the satisfiability threshold? It's just solving the, um, this equals zero. So this is the point where you go from an exponentially growing number of clusters to an exponentially shrinking number of clusters. And, um, uh, and so that's, that's the prediction for the satisfiability threshold. And, and with uh, Jean Ding and Nike Sun, we are able to establish this prediction when, when k is sufficiently large. And, um, and it essentially comes down to applying the second moment method to the number of clusters, but not the overall number of clusters. You have to, you have to sort of carefully select a certain subset of clusters uh, because uh, to make the second moment method work. Um, and, you know, I won't, I won't tell you about the 200 pages of uh, sort of how you do that in this talk, but, but it's, uh, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's sort of the satisfiability threshold. Um, for the rest of the talk, I want to talk about questions beyond the satisfiability threshold. So what can we say about um, particularly the condensation regime? But maybe I'll, I'll pause for a moment in case uh, anyone has any more questions. People have been asking them as, as we go along and, and please continue to do that. Uh, okay, well, um, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead. So, so in this, I'll, I'll talk, as I said, about the condensation regime. And, um, and this will be specifically um, for the not -all equal sat model, although something slightly different, but very similar applies in, in each of the other models that I'll talk about too. Uh, although the not -all equal sat model is the only one for which we have uh, proofs for. Um, um, <clears throat> okay, so imagine um, we write down the expected number of solutions and break it up according to the size of uh, the, the clusters that they're in. So we say that the number of clusters of size e to the n times s will be e to the n times sigma of s, where sigma is a function called the cluster entropy function. So you have to you know, take a leap of faith and assume that such a function actually exists, but let's say that it does. Then if we 
sort of decompose the expectation this way, because it's on an exponential scale, the biggest contribution is going to come from, uh, or most of the contribution is going to come from the maximum term when s plus sigma of s is biggest, or equivalently where the derivative of sigma is minus one. Um, so that's this tangent point here. And this is what the picture will look like in the, the clustered regime. As we increase the density of constraints, the number of clusters will decrease. The condensation threshold will be the point where this tangent point lies on the x-axis. In the condensation regime, it lies strictly below the x-axis. And the satisfiability threshold is the point where the maximum of sigma is on the x-axis. And the unsat regime, it's negative for all values of s. Um, and now let me, um, let's look particularly at the, the condensation regime and what's happening here. Um, the biggest contribution to the expected value corresponds to a, a value of s for which sigma is negative, which means that there's the expected number of them is exponentially small. In other words, we don't expect to see them at all in a typical solution. So what, so the typical number of solutions will be much smaller than the expected number. Um, so what is the, uh, what should the typical number of solutions be? Well, it will be the largest size that actually does appear. So the largest root of sigma. Um, and so the number of clusters of that size uh, will be e to the n times zero or just order one. And that's really why we expect to see most of the mass in just a constant number of clusters when we're in the condensation regime. If you, if you interpret sigma as sort of not just as a um, expected number of clusters, but also encoding some sort of Poisson density, that would lead you to a, a, the Poisson Dirichlet um, uh, assumption for, for those of you who know what that, uh, that means. Okay, uh, so just to summarize, if we know what sigma is and that it actually exists, then we could read off the satisfiability threshold the condensation threshold and, and the free energy in the condensation regime, sort of the number of the exponential growth rate of the number of solutions. So all, all of the, you know, several of the things that we want to understand for these models. Um, and uh, and, that, and uh, several of these predictions have now been rigorously established. The, uh, the satisfiability threshold has been established in four of these, these models. Um, the condensation threshold was first established for random colorings by Kojo Glan and his group, um, and, and also later for the random regular not equal sat model. Um, and the, the final most refined question, how many solutions there are in the condensation regime as uh, was, was established by um, um, joint work with Nike Sun and Yu Meng Zhang, uh, again in this regular not equal sat model, sort of the easiest of, uh, um, of the models. So let me tell you now how, how you can actually work out sigma and how you can um, make establish these predictions. So, so when we write the expected value of z, as we said, this was sort of corresponded to maximizing s plus sigma of s. If we wanted the expected number of clusters, well, that would be maximizing, that would correspond to sort of e to the n times the maximum of sigma of s. So, uh, so if you're maximizing sigma of s, you want the, the derivative to be zero or equivalently maximizing zero times s plus sigma of s. But we're interested in sort of this point on lying on the x-axis where the derivative is will be minus lambda for some lambda strictly between zero and one. And if we want to sort of access that point, we, we want to maximize lambda times s plus sigma of s. And, um, and doing that is equivalent to taking all the clusters, taking their size to the power of lambda and summing them all up. And that's um, what I'll call z lambda. So it's so you sum over clusters, their size to the power of lambda. And then the biggest contribution for that will be correspond to maximizing lambda s plus sigma of s. 
Um, okay, so, um, okay, and, and in terms of why this is a reasonable sort of thing to, to do, if I take the normalized log of expected value of Z lambda, then the limit of this should just be the maximum of lambda s plus sigma of s. That's just the Legendre transform of sigma of s. And since we expect sigma to be concave, if we can compute its Legendre transform, we could invert that and, and back out the value of sigma if we, can, if we can compute these quantities. So we want to, so for that reason, we want to compute this uh, quantity Z lambda. But initially this might seem like a, you know, an unrealistic thing to try and compute because we're essentially taking clusters, raising their size to a non-integer power and then adding them up, which doesn't sound promising in combinatorially. But it turns out that it can be done um, by thinking of Z lambda as a, <clears throat> as a random constraint satisfaction problem with weights on the free variables. Um, and why on the free variables? Well, if I want to know the size of the cluster, that's just how many solutions there are in the cluster, which is how many ways of assigning the, the free variables to be either pluses or minuses. And, um, okay. and it turns out that the free variables have sort of fairly simple structures. Most of them are just sort of isolated away from the other free variables and then can be set to be plus or minus independently of any other one. But some of, the, uh, some of the free variables are next to each other and have um, sort of constraints between them. Um, um, but, but, they, but these constraints form trees so that the free variables can be divided into a, into a forest of very sort of subcritical trees, typically of size order one, the biggest of size log n. And for each tree, you can compute how many ways there are to assign the free variables. And then the size of the cluster is just the product over all the, the trees. So, so we take a more enriched model where the free variables know not only what, um, uh, that they're free, but also what sort of tree of free variables they lie inside and, and also where they lie within inside that tree. Um, and then using an algorithm called belief propagation, we can uh, determine sort of weights for each of the free variables and also the clauses and edges in, the, in those trees, such that the product of the weights together gives um, uh, the number of solutions for that tree. And then if we want the number of solutions for the whole frozen model configuration, we just take the product of the weights for all of, uh, all of the free variables in the, <clears throat> um, in the whole graph. And if we want the weight to the power of lambda, we just take um, the, the variable weights to the power of lambda and take a product of all of those. And so we get um, uh, Z lambda to be a sum, uh, to, uh, Z lambda will be you know, the partition function of, um, uh, of this weighted frozen model. Um, and essentially the, the proof now will correspond to or you know, um, applying the moment me method to Z lambda. Um, and so the, the way we do that, and I'll, I'll say this sort of very quickly, but um, we'll fix the empiric. So we, so we want to calculate the moment expected value of Z lambda. We'll also want to calculate its square. Um, and the way we can do that is first fix an empirical distribution. So this will, and by empirical distribution of a, of a, I mean like the number of pluses, the number of minuses, the number of free variables, the number of pluses next to minuses and various kinds of um, combinations like that, sort of like a, a demographic profile of the, um, of one of these solutions. Once you fix the empirical distribution, then writing down its contribution to the expected value just becomes a product of, of the weights, which are just a function of the empirical distribution, times a product of, or a ratio of multinomial coefficients. Um, and so for the multinomial coefficients, you can um, apply Stirling's formula a bunch of times, um, expand that out, and um, 
you will get e to the n times some function uh, phi of uh, the empirical distribution plus some lower order term, which has sort of come is where all the sort of square root of two pi n's from Sterling's formula goes. Um, and then if you wanted the, just the expected value of Z lambda, you would sum over all of the empirical distributions, but because this is on an exponential scale, only the maximum one is going to contribute in the limit. So we want to, so we have some function phi, that's a function of the empirical distribution, and we want to maximize that. But this function phi is, it's not concave, um, and it's quite high dimensional. So, so the maximization problem can be quite tricky. Um, and, and essentially most of, the, most of the work in these problems, sometimes, you know, sometimes over a hundred pages of work can be in terms of doing this maximization problem. Now these maximizers um, can be, uh, like by, basically by taking derivatives, can be shown to be solutions of certain fixed point uh, of uh, what are called belief propagation equations. Um, but they're just standard belief propagation equations are quite, are not, are not very tractable because they're in term, um, um, they're what, what I'll call two-sided belief propagation equations. Um, but in, in work with Nike Sun and Yu Meng Zhang, we were able to show that uh, the, the maximizer satisfies uh, a simpler set of one-sided belief propagation equations. And, and so we're able to determine what the maximizer was and, and in particular that it's what the physicist predicted it should be. And in doing so, we were able to, to work out the sort of um, exponential growth rate of the number of solutions and that it matches the, the prediction uh, from the physicists during the, uh, throughout the condensation regime. I should say before the condensation regime, the, the, number, the, uh, the number of solutions is just given by the, its expected value, which is a, a simpler formula. Uh, so there's the sort of a phase transition at the condensation regime where you get a more complicated formula. Um, but uh, this work, um, there's a, in the formula, we have this sort of plus little o of n term. So essentially the formula we were, we were computing was, was off by a sort of e to the little o of n factor. So it's only really the exponential growth rate. It's not precisely telling you how many solutions you have. And so this wasn't sufficient for, um, to prove some of the more refined properties of uh, um, the condensation regime, in particular, the fact that most of the solutions lie in just a small number of clusters. Uh, and so uh, more recently, just uh, at the end of last year with Danny Nam and Yong Tak Sun, uh, we were able to show that when K is sufficiently large, um, most of the mass of the solutions do appear in the, the largest few clusters. Um, and, and to do that, we, we worked out the um, partition function up to a sort of order one multiplicative factor so, so in the work, in the earlier work, um, we showed that it was approximately e to the n phi of alpha, um, but it turns out there's also a polynomial correction term to that. Um, but the, that gives you the, the size of the number of solutions and the, the few biggest clusters are, are also of the same order of magnitude. And so in particular, this means that you have this uh, replica symmetry breaking property. So if you pick two solutions at random, and look at how far they are apart, then, it, um, then it, that will be concentrated on two points. Um, and essentially to, to carry this program out, the main challenge was the fact that the trees of free variables are essentially unbounded. And the biggest ones are of size uh, log n. Um, and we had to essentially, um, come up with a way of summing over um, sort of all the possibilities of uh, trees of free variables, even as the, as the sort of possibilities uh, grows as a function of n. Um, 
Okay, and uh, I think uh, I'll uh, finish off there. So thanks for listening. Okay. Thanks. Any questions from the audience? Well, while the audience is, they are thinking their questions. I have one question. Hmm. Is, is there any way you can describe, I mean, if you move, uh, I don't know, the number of, of, of clauses or if you increase the, hmm. the number of um, conditions per clause, can you describe how the clusters are breaking up or you are losing solutions? Is there? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So at least when you're close to the satisfiability threshold, um, the, the, when you add in clauses, the clusters will are really just uh, sort of shrinking and disappearing. Um, sometimes you add in a, in a clause and it sort of between some free variables and it means that um, there's some extra constraint between them and they become frozen essentially. Other times you add in a, in a extra constraint and then it's just incompatible with the, that cluster and then the cluster just disappears. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, that, that's sort of what, uh, what will happen to it in a typical cluster. Of course, the ones, um, the ones that contribute most of the solutions are sort of fairly atypical clusters um, because, because they're just bigger than all of the rest of, of the others. And if you, if you look at what's happening as you, as you sort of increase the, the constraints, sort of which one is the biggest is going to change over time. So, um, um, and it's sort of tied up in, I mean, there should be a sort of large deviation theory for how the, um, the, the sort of cluster sizes evolve. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, so James Martin just said uh, the methods uh, have some similarity to large deviation theory. Indeed, they have a, they have a lot um, of, uh, and uh, um, oh, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I guess um, we do, we can answer some of the, those questions, but, but maybe not, not all of them. Um, in turn, uh, so Pablo asked a, a question of, can we uh, sort of simulate what a, a solution would look like? Um, I think, yeah, so we can't, we won't be able to find a solution in a random formula, but we, we do know what, um, we could construct a sort of the joint distribution of a, of a typical solution and uh, so, 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 yeah, yeah. So, so we could describe what uh, a random solution looks like, and we can we can describe that in quite a lot of detail. We can say what its local weak limit looks like, what a solution looks like around its uh, a random uh, point. Um, but that's by sort of first fixing the solution and then looking at the the rest of the um, yeah. So, so it's not algorithm, not not an algorithmic way of uh, finding a solution. Okay, maybe, maybe I have one more question. Okay. Uh, are there any software methods, uh, 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 software models where where you put a Hamiltonian, say that vanishes when you satisfy the constraints, and then? Yeah. So so. Um, a lot of the challenge comes from the fact that the constraints here are hard. And uh, so if you just, so, so, uh, so for, for some class of models that are sort of, I guess, anti-ferromagnetic in the right way, you can use um, the interpolation method of the of sort of Guerra originally for the SK model. 
Uh, and then uh, I guess friends and the only um, used it in the context of sparse random constraint satisfaction problems to show uh, that uh, essentially limits of say the, the free energy. Um, so, or, or um, but that only works when you have soft constraints and not um, the, the sort of hard constraints of constraint satisfaction problems. There, here the sort of challenge is that sort of adding in one solution or, or one clause could in principle erase all of the so solutions and the, um, and, and so that's, uh, that's sort of been the obstacle to um, softer methods of proof. But, but yeah, if you, uh, something like the, the POTS model or the anti-ferromagnetic easing model, I actually anti-ferromagnetic POTS model or easing model, uh, there, are, uh, there are alternative approaches that, that don't focus so much on calculations on the software. Okay, thank you. I think we, we can stop uh, the screen sharing. And uh, okay, let's, let's thank Alan again for this wonderful talk. Thanks, thanks for listening. We cannot hear the rest of the participants, but they are. Uh, I think uh, uh, now finally the, the question and answer being popped up. Uh, <laughs> uh, there is someone raising the, the hand in the top. Oh, yeah. Hi. Yeah. Maybe you say something. Jaime, do you want to ask something? You have, you have raised your hand. Okay, well, um, thanks again, uh, and uh, hope uh, everyone enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.